so uh, I'm Justin Edgar. I'm a solutions architect for FireEye. Uh, my briefing today is rock drops and dragon's teeth. We're going to talk about uh, North and South Korea, uh, talk specifically about the city of uh, Paju, uh, South Korea, and then we'll transition some of those lessons learned and concepts into uh, some security best practices. Uh, again, this is not a vendor spiel. Um, so we're not going to talk FireEye products. We're not talking FireEye services. We're going to have a general conversation about uh, general best practices. Hopefully that's desirable. Here's our agenda. I'll talk about me, talk about North and South Korea, talk about uh, the city of Paju, and then we'll do some transition into the IT applicability of those lessons learned. Myself, uh, again, Justin Edgar, Solutions Architect for FireEye. I come from uh, the Mandiant side originally. I was a product consultant there for a few years, and then moved over to the dark side of sales about two and a half years ago now. Um, I'm a California native, despite having bounced around in the Army for quite a few years uh, and found myself back here where all my family and my wife's family are. Uh, so I have a vested interest in you know, the state and local government here, and that supports the, the region to which I'm assigned. So I'm a, a SLED architect, so state, local, and education in California, everything north of Bakersfield. Uh, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, uh, and I'm a veteran. Again, spent 12 years in the Army, um, not in the IT side, more of a, a, a trigger puller role, if you will. So I was an armor officer, spent uh, some time as a scout platoon leader, finished up as a tank company commander uh, before I left the Army. So let's talk about Korea. Anybody here of Korean descent or have family or relatives that are Korean? No? Okay. So Korea is pretty interesting. You look through the history of it. So Korea was its own independent peninsula and country prior to World War II. Um, during World War II, uh, Korea was invaded by the Japanese. Um, when World War II came to a conclusion, much like the city of Berlin, Korea was split in half between a Soviet side in the north and a U.S. side in the south, along the generally along the 38th parallel. Um, and that division is what we call today the DMZ, or the Demilitarized Zone. That was supposed to be temporary, much like Berlin was supposed to be temporary. But after World War II, relations between the Allies, Soviets, and, and U.S. fell apart, mostly due to, as you'd expect, some, some doctrinal or some, some uh, uh, hypothetical kind of conventional uh, disagreements. The U.S. took over the kind of ownership of South Korea quite quickly, right? We, we sent troops there. We became embedded. We started working with the South Korean uh, government to rebuild the, that, that country. In the North, however, the North Koreans were more of a, uh, a Stalinist regime, and Russia having a lot of stuff to do with some of the Eastern Bloc, bloc breakoff and some revolution, uh, re revolutions in Hungary kind of took a step back and decided, you know, we think that North Korea is aligned with our ideology, you know, they have a Stalinist approach, um, we're going to go ahead and let them be. And the, the leaders of the revolutionary forces that fought against the Japanese started to become the leaders of North Korea. And this is where we start to see kind of the rise of Kim Sung-il. Uh, excuse me, Kim Il-sung. Um, after a while, North Koreans decided, hey, we got our own country here. We've got all these Russian munitions and arms. South Koreans are kind of doing the U.S. thing. They're not really falling under this uh, the Stalinist view uh, that we have. So maybe we had to go ahead and reunite Korea as one Korea under a Stalinist regime. And this is kind of the impetus for the Korean War. North Korea, kind of uh, relatively uh, surreptitiously or relatively with, with little notice, attacks South into South Korea, captures very quickly the capital city of Seoul, which is not very far from the, the 38th parallel, and starts advancing, advancing southward. Uh, UN-backed troops then came in from the south, and we're all very familiar, I think, with MacArthur's uh, amphibious landing in Incheon, took back Seoul, pushed the uh, North Korean forces back north of the DMZ, and at that point, Chinese forces from the north became involved, and we all settled back out at the status quo after the, life, uh, the loss of lots of uh, life uh, and the destruction of lots of industry in northern Korea. Um, so today we can still see that evident. A lot of industry that's been destroyed through bombing and efforts uh, during the Korean War uh, remain, remain destroyed today, and that's kind of the reason for a lot of the, the economic challenges that they still have. Kim Il-sung, again, the, the general, the leader of the resistance forces against the Japanese, the, the leader of the invasion into South Korea following uh, during the Korean War, 
um, comes up with this idea of Chuche, which is self-reliance. And this starts their path of a division from the Stalinist point of view or the Stalinist um, mindset. Whereas, you know, Stalin and Lenin and Marx were kind of dealt, developed this, pol this cult of personality, right? They were very strong, personal, charismatic figures. Uh, people really flocked to them. There's writings on them, right? And they're also able to manipulate history as a result. Kim Il-sung decided to depart from that, that way of thinking and come up with his own. And he calls that Chuche. And that's still present today in North Korea. It's kind of the mindset that, that fuels um, the way they do business. Um, he then also started developing his own cult of personality, right? Cult of personality meaning that the person himself became elevated above his position, um, almost deification, became a, a godlike personage, um, and as a result was able to, again, rewrite history and change the way that his people were exposed to the outside world and were educated on the way that their country had been formed. Uh, and this becomes significant because as we see the kind of decline of King, Kim Il-sung and the subsequent rise of Kim Jong-il, the deification of Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung remains present, right? He's got the big statues outside of all, the, you know, the, the huge bronze statues and the big towers. Um, and Kim Jong-il's decision was, I'm not going to try to deify myself like my, like my father. Instead, I'm going to become the leader of the party, the ministry that promotes his deification. So instead of, he was less charismatic, he kind of would not have been as, as readily uh, accepted uh, to the same level as of Kim uh, Il-sung. So he became the leader of the party that supported the deification of his father, if that makes sense. A smart move on his part. As a result, we see things like this today. Anybody see anything interesting about these, these picture frames? Interesting, interesting. Anything else? Look at the picture frames themselves. They're at an angle. You look at the side of these picture frames, by law in North Korea, framed pictures, which have to be in every room of every house and every building, have to have these state-approved frames, which always imply that the great leader is looking down at you from wherever you are. Uh, and this kind of is, is further kind of evidence of the, that deification, right? He's elevated himself to godlike personality. They manipulate history to support that deification. And then his son, Kim Jong-il, with whom we're familiar, uh, supported or, or, or led the, the revolution to, to back that deification. Kind of interesting. So North Korea as a whole is highly nationalistic. And nationalistic to the point of xenophobia. They essentially cut off ties with the outside world, particularly the European world. And then slowly over time started cutting off the ties with the, the Stalinist regimes or the Mao regimes of, of Soviet uh, Russia and China. Uh, and this becomes interesting over time because you see as the Korean politi politics advance, you know, into the late 70s, early 80s, 90s, there's a distancing of those, you know, formerly aligned entities with, with North Korea, which leaves them alone and unafraid. Um, in, in an industrial perspective, they act very much like a Stalinist regime. They focus highly on industrial production and steel production less on consumer goods. And that's very evident today in the kind of state of life of the average you know, North Korean. They don't have very much. What's provided by the state is mostly leverage for military or military first operations. They're also characterized by grandiose nationalistic expenditures. Uh, in fact, uh, some say that Kim Jong-il himself was the single greatest consumer, direct consumer of Hennessy in the world. Uh, the, the cognac, I guess, it is not my thing. But I found that interesting. You see things like the Juche Tower here, which is one of the largest, um, it's actually 170 meters tall, uh, granite structure, highlighting the power of, of uh, Korean government and kind of try, attempting to legitimize themselves to these huge, big uh, monoliths and, and uh, um, monuments, while, of course, the population is, is generally starving. And one thing I found interesting, they operate on their own time. So Pyongyang time is GMT, 8, uh, GMT plus 8.5. I don't know if I trust anybody that operates in these 0.5 time zones, especially as a, you know, for instant response purposes. <laughs> it's hard enough to roll everything back to GMT as it is. To highlight kind of the current state of these efforts, here's North Korea in the dark, literally in the dark. Um, a marked uh, difference between their neighbors to the north, China, and their neighbors to the south, South Korea. 
these expenditures and these decisions to enforce a very uh, ambitious, if you can say, leadership regime, coupled with their vast expenditures for military and industrial production, an absence in general of uh, consumer goods, and a reliance on energy production locally for the agricultural areas re results in something like this, which is highly anomalous in today's, uh, in today's world. Right? Here's your sign, right? <laughs> this is part of the problem. So let's talk about the DMZ. As IT practitioners generally, DMZ is a term with which we're familiar. Right? A DMZ in the Korea context is the most militarized uh, area in, in the, on the globe. Right? There's no other place in the globe where there's such a significant military presence. In essence, we have one million North Korean soldiers sitting four kilometers and staring at one million South Korean soldiers across a fenced and, and mined-like hell region that we call the DMZ. There are a few places that it's crossed legitimately. The most popular, of course, is the Joint Security Area, which is the big blue buildings, uh, UN Blue, where the North Korean em emissaries and South Korean emissaries can talk a, upon occasion. Most of the time, it's just the North Korean army standing there staring at the South Korean army across the border. Um, there's also the Kaesong Industrial Region, uh, which is leveraged based upon the political climate. It's a place where South Korean uh, industry can take place for a fraction of the cost in North Korea. So there's some railroad tracks, and you can kind of see these here, um, right near the joint security area, that allow um, workers and products and, and goods to be exchanged between the two countries. Less legitimate are four known uh, in invasion tunnels from North Korea into South Korea. And you can see these highlighted these little pipes here uh, across the border. So big red line, which is no-go. A couple places where you can cross potentially legitimately the, the two countries. And then a few known places where uh, infiltration tunnels were built into uh, South Korea. It's also interesting, a, a propaganda village in North Korea, which is a place that's a fake, essentially, city. Lights are on and off and timers. People kind of come in and look like they're doing things. They used to blast a lot of propaganda at the DMZ. You know, okay, Korean, South Korean officers, if you guys are unhappy, come on over to this bountiful land of, uh, that is North Korea uh, instead of kind of the, the Hunger Games-esque reality that it is today. This is a joint security area. As you can see, is kind of this uncomfortable stalemate between the North Korean and the South Korean army. On the near side, this is the Republic of Korea, so South Korea, denoted by their, their black uniforms and their kind of characteristic stance. See so the guys on either side that split the building, so only use, you view the uh, South Korean side with half of their body. And the South Koreans march through and make a little less of a, a permanent presence uh, at the joint security area. You can see there's a building there on the South Korean side. There's an equivalent, slightly larger, of course, as we go through this posturing and saber rattling uh, bit between the two countries, uh, a similar building on the south side for South Korea. We usually see this view. I think it's interesting to note there are multiple buildings, and there are multiple places where this um, activity occurs in parallel at the Joint Security Area. Has anybody ever been there to JSA? You have? Am I wrong? It's kind of weird. Kind of a Probably one of the craziest places you go to on Earth. Uh, coming from the north side, there's a few articles about people who have done it. You can take a straight shot from Pyongyang down to uh, the joint security area, passing through a variety of security checkpoints. And as you're approaching the joint security area, there's a beautiful museum that highlights uh, the American surrenders, Americans surrendered on their knees to North Korea, kind of you know, giving up and, and retaining the status quo, uh, maintaining the victory status for the great leader. Uh, significant amounts of pop propaganda along the way, as you might imagine. This is all an interesting read, by the way. If you guys get a chance to kind of do some research, the whole story, over time, this is going to be fantasy, right? In a, in a millennium, people are not going to even believe this kind of stuff happened. There's, there's no way. It's, it's out of bounds. Um, but certainly something cool to research now. So let's look at Paju. We talked about the DMZ. The DMZ is kind of this little black line here. We talked about the Joint Security Area, which is a nice little red X here. Just south of that, alone and unafraid, is the Korean city of Paju. And I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, so forgive me. Paju is really the first stop for the North Koreans to take the highway to Seoul, the capital of, of South Korea. Um, kind of a convenient place, right? Oh, the infrastructure's built. Let's just go south, catch the road, cross the JSA, and, and down we go. 
Paju, as you might uh, think, is also well within shelling distance of North Korea. Uh, and North Korea has one of the largest collections of artillery pieces in the world, over 21,000 pieces of artillery that can be leveraged to uh, really just shell the hell out of poor uh, Paju. But this, there's some interesting approaches. We'll talk about the security pieces here. The Paju is really part of a what we call a mobile defense uh, of the region, right? So Paju is a well-known first stop on the way to South Korea. They've already, in the Korean War, experienced how quickly North Korean troops can move south to capture Seoul. Uh, and that's a significant pop propaganda blow. You start putting North Koreans with North Korean flags in the capital of the country you're invading, you're kind of most of the way there, right? You imagine the, the psychological blow that might be. So what have they done? I think it's kind of fun because some of, this, some of these pictures are straight out of Google Maps. So you can go, you can do street view of some of this. Um, but what they've done is they've instrumented the city of Paju to be a delaying action, a assumed failure of the most militarized uh, place in the world, uh, moving to prevent southern bound movement of the North Korean troops. And you can see some of the pictures here, some of the things they've done. These are kind of, these little white spots are concrete overpasses that span the highway. We showed you that highway going south. Uh, and they call them the, the overpasses to nowhere. Right? You'll notice that there's no reason to have an over underpass here. It's just a creek or whatever. But they built this overpass uh, along the main routes. Also south here, any idea what those might be? So, so those are dragon's teeth. So anti-tank barriers built into the landscape. A lot of this landscape has been human made. So you see what's really kind of a canal here. Um, might even be considered a tank ditch, potentially. We've got dragon's teeth where that canal has to be broken for probably aggregation or irrigation or water flow. And then we have these huge concrete structures that are rigged for detonation, last minute detonation. You can see some of the workings in these. Um, there's some articles about them. You also can literally street view Anytime you go to, if you go look at Paju or Paju on, on Google, anytime you see the highway crossed by one of these white concrete barriers and there's not another highway that's crossing, um, you can drop in there and check them out. And you can see, you know, these ladders and these places where, you know, electronics and mechanisms are in place to, to allow these to be dropped. And they'll blow these overpasses up, drop them across the road, and prevent the southern movement of, of enemy troops. Kind of crazy. Like, why are we doing this? if we're sitting south of what's probably, uh, arguably, the most secure and militarized point in the world, right? The assumption is that's going to fail. And that's something we'll talk about later when we start tying this back into IT, right? And I know we're not here for a history conference, so <laughs> forgive me. Another thing that's interesting is, uh, so I was a tanker in my former life, by, you know, 40 pounds uh, lighter and a lot less hairy. Um, so I was a tank officer, a tank commander. Uh, what you see here is a cross-section of a tank round called um, MPAT OR, or Multipurpose Anti-Tank Obstacle Reducing. Um, what's significant about these rounds is the only place that, at least when I was in, this may have changed in the last seven years, um, Korea is the only place where we deploy these particular munitions, and particularly when we battle carry these munitions, meaning we have them in tanks that are ready to go. And they're used in addition to or conjunction with um, the pre-configured, you know, electronically supported rock drops to blow concrete pylons as, as U.S. Army tanks advance to the south from um, the DMZ, again, building this slowing movement, right, and trying to, to reduce the speed of the troops, the North Korean troops moving south. Um, so that's pretty interesting. The only place you'll see those is in Korea to facilitate this effort, really a custom-built piece of munition, um, which speaks to the, the breach response, if you will, of both U.S. For forces and Korean forces. Just so you know, these, these dragon's teeth here to the right, so these are dragon's teeth, a bunch of concrete barriers, which were really difficult for tanks and their tracks to, to negotiate. Right? You might get a track on top of one, but then you'll high center on the next one is why those are effective. Um, these are actually uh, in Europe in a remnant of World War II, but the best picture I could find. So these cattle are probably not representative of the cattle in South Korea. So forgive me for not being authentic. So how do you defend, defend a town that's with, within range of you know, 21,000 artillery pieces? You don't. When the call comes, you move south, right? You've, you've planned to fight, you've planned for failure, you fight a delaying movement to the south, and you recover you know, in the soft core uh, of what you're, you're kind of born and what, you're, what you seek to defend. So let's look at that from an information security perspective. 
We've talked about the DMZ already, right? Big red line in the sand, you know, thou, you shall not pass, you know, like Gandalf. Um, active crossing measures that are known, active crossing measures that are not known, probably typical of most of our IT environments. So if we turn that on the side a little bit, and we strip away all the geo stuff, we're left with some, some ugly lines. We clean that up, and that looks a lot like a lot of our infrastructure diagrams if we start describing them to vendors. As a vendor, I know, because that's what I see a lot of the time. We have some sort of perimeter defense. We knew everything on the outside, which we typically you know, call north. You know, That's the outside world. The internet is bad. Everything on the inside, south of that, is typically, typically considered good. We have reasons that things pass those borders. Right? We have our, our firewalls in place, and we have permitted connections. We also have business reasons that things cross those borders. So on the you know, connection side, maybe the connection side is, is the joint security area. And that's the bridge icon in, in uh, military lexography, if, if you care, little brackets. So that's a place where normal people would go and, and traverse that border. Right? That's where your internet traffic goes. Maybe that's your web proxy before the firewall. On the other side, you have business reasons to cross that. Maybe that's your DMZ. Crazy how we recycle that term. That's where your web servers are at. That's where you would expect the public to come to interface with you and do business in your organization. Um, and also, as we find out over time, and, and typically after the tunnels are dug, we have these illegitimate crossing points that are established within our environment. Typically for a couple of reasons. Misconfiguration, error could be one. Right? That, those, that happens all the time. Firewalls, firewall management. Anybody fire, manage firewalls? You do? It's hard. You know, you've got 300 requests every day. You've got to stack these tiers of rules. You know, it's easy to make mistakes. In the public sector, that's usually one dude trying to do it. Um, and if someone comes in and picks up his, his configuration, you know, <laughs> only that person knows the reasoning behind a lot of those changes. The other reason, of course, is threat, ba threat actor based, right? Threat actors establish a foothold in the environment and then surreptitiously, surreptitiously punch holes in our network security perimeter to gain access, right? Then you have two way communications an ability to infiltrate without having detection or without having observation on that traffic. You know, that's why we call them tunnels as well. DNS tunneling, ICMP tunneling, right? You're surreptitiously maintaining a means of communication where you're not supposed to. Very similar to this DMZ penetration model here. That, that model looks a lot like most of the infrastructure diagrams, as I said before. Uh, I do a search, and you can tell what day I put this together by the little Google doodle. Um, Perimeter diagrams all pretty much look like that. Something in the perimeter, something in the inside, some reason to traverse that perimeter. Uh, and these are all just general, right? You know, they're, they're, there's nothing too specific to dive into there. But something we see every day. Perimeter-centric defense, assuming that defense is going to work. So as we've seen in Korea, and we've seen in the defensive posturing in South Korea today, we have to assume that perimeter defenses will fail. Right? My manager says 10-foot wall, 11-foot ladder all the time. Someone says Ben Franklin said that. I'd rather attribute that quote to Ben Franklin than to my manager, but you know, I don't have any hard evidence on that one. Maybe he wins the day. You know, if you're going to build a 10-foot wall, someone's going to build an 11-foot ladder. If you build a 10-foot wall, someone's going to dig a 6-foot hole. There's always ways to get around. We have to be prepared for that. Right? And I think as an industry, we're transitioning away from the perimeter-centric defense model, moving into defense in depth. What I don't see us doing is assuming that the defenses will, will fail and preparing ourselves to do so. And we'll talk about a few things, or at least some conversations we can have around what to do under that assumption, right? FireEye is a company, Mandiant is a company, Kevin Mandia is our CEO, will all tell you the same thing. Breach is inevitable, right? Prevention is going to fail. So we'll talk about that more in depth. Defense in depth, also good, right? But let's assume that, that prevention measure is gonna fail as well. Let's build that into the plan. You know, as IT practitioners, we're all just risk assessors all the time. You know, despite the fact we get bogged down in the minutia of user requests and account management and you know, firewall management and log analysis and alert review, all we're doing at a micro level is analyzing risk on a daily basis because we can't do everything every day. What's important? What's that mean? What's the context? What do I do about it? How do I communicate these things that I'm doing to management so I can find a way, a solution to solve those problems so I can go and find, solve larger problems? Uh, that's always a challenge. So how do you prepare for catastrophic failure of prevent preventative measures? We've seen a failure in industry, you know, uh, in the news very frequently. 
you know, people that are not prepared to respond to catastrophic failure prevention. Um, we don't need to get into specifics about the breaches, but if they're big ones in the news, uh, newses, big ones in the news, forgive me, uh, that's a pretty good uh, example of, of what not to do. So let's talk about four different scenarios and kind of cascading from the point of failure on, right? Point of failure one, rolling barrages of artillery fire are gonna interrupt my daily life, right? If I live in Paju and I'm trained every day to respond to this incursion from the north, what's the expectation? On a daily basis, I'm ready for hails of, of you know, unending hails of artillery shells to be pounded upon my city uh, with the expe expectation that I still have to run out there, get underneath that overpass, and poke the battery up to those explosives. Someone's still got to get in the tank and fire that impact OR round at the rock drops to drop those things off, right? We're preparing ourselves for these catastrophic consequences. So the first one is, what's the C2 plan, right? When there's an attack, who do we talk to? Can we talk? Do we go out of band? Do you guys have out of band communication? Let's say email's compromised, right? How do you communicate that you know the email's compromised to your leadership securely when email is compromised. You know, do we have a, a method for out of band communication? We'll talk about that. The perimeter is breached. So, you know, bad guys are crossing the border, they're moving through our perimeter, they're invading, you know, the soft guts of our organization. What do we do? So, in this case, in the IT side, this is when a foothold's been established, communication con and command and control has been effective, and bad guys are actively able to evade any defensive measures we have in place, right? They're moving through the tunnels. They've made it through. And they're now infiltrating and stealthily into, uh, into the environment. The North Korean soldiers would put South Korean uniforms on, right? How do you detect that? You know, that's the challenge we have today. That's why we have an industry around that, UEBA, or UBA, right? The user and event behavior analytics, finding that North Korean soldier wearing the South Korean uniform because he's where a South Korean soldier typically would not be, or he's doing things a South Korean soldier typically would not be doing. Right, that's the impetus for that entire effort. Charlie's in the wire. Dudes are in the wire, right? Credentials, legitimate credentials have been exfiltrated. Potentially privileges have been escalated. Administrative credentials are in the wire. You essentially have bad guys everywhere, right? There's no way to tell if a machine's been infected. There's no way to tell if admin traffic is legitimate or not. That's kind of the next uh, worst case scenario from a de defensive perspective. And then finally, the underbelly's exposed. Um, rear echelon troops, like we, we'd call them trains in the military, right? Your, your beans and bullets, the things that are set, supposed to be set so far back from contact that they are generally, you know, less defended, kind of like your databases or data stores, you know, servers on the inside, et cetera. Um, that's your, your supply train, essentially. So that's when, that's when the, the attack has been successful, and now, you know, they're at the exploit area. Seoul's been captured, North Korean flag's been raised, uh, you know, supply trains are being overrun. So let's talk about each individual one of those categories. Any questions so far? Okay. So what's your comms plan? Do you have a comms plan? What happens when, you know, the inevitable, the, the fecal matter hits the rotating blades from an IT perspective? And are we planning for that? Out-of-band comms is one of the most common places where people don't put any effort and have to figure it out on the fly. You know, if my infrastructure is compromised and I can't guarantee that I can send commu uh, secure communications between myself, my team, my leadership, other relevant teams, we'll talk about that, um, then what are you, you know, you're, you're gonna be grasping at straws. You're already behind and this is something that you can plan for and I think do so very well. Maybe it's Gmail, maybe you have Gmail accounts. Gmail accounts that don't have your usernames or it can be associated back to your usernames from the environment, so you can start communicating out of band. Um, cell phones, of course, become more and more prevalent, but those are fallible. Um, a lot of different ways to, to go through that. The last piece is, what are the, or the next piece is teams. What teams are relevant? As IT security practitioners, we live in our little bubbles, and we stay within our little bubbles, and we talk to people who sit on the edge of our bubbles, but we don't go any further. Right? We assume, assume that our leadership is gonna bring in the right people, that they know how to bring in the right people. But as we've seen in these major breaches, HR and media failures are the first thing that the public sees. And the, the failure of these is really gonna impact the next steps of the breach. You're, again, you're behind the ball if you're not planning for these things. Do you have a HR 
team on, on, um, on site that can perform some of these actions and do some of the conversations internally? Maybe. If not, do you have a retainer in place? There's some options there to gain, to, to kind of maintain these comms. Next piece is legal, of course. Something's happened. We're going to go frantically try to solve it because we're engineers and practitioners and this is what we do. But there are legal aspirations and aspects to this as well. If I'm going to go and log into a server that I know is compromised, that has a bunch of PHI or PII or proprietary data, whatever it is, what's the legal implication of that? If that data, data starts to move through the environment, I notify somebody what's the legal implication of that. So having these plans in place protects us and gets us ahead of the ball slightly at the point of penetration. And then rehearse. Probably the piece that's most important for any military option or operation, the piece, that's, the piece that's least frequently executed, is the rehearsal. What happens when these scenarios occur? And then, of course, perform a risk analysis. So if I know what data I have, and I know what my public exposure is, I have a pretty good idea of the threat actors that are going to come after me on a daily basis. Right? If I have medical data, Right now, the Chinese are actively act looking at medical data. Right? They're trying to collect medical data because part of their um, reform or part of their, their, their charge as a country in their five-year, their, their, I think it's the sixth, 15th plan, right? Year, or 15-year plan right now, is to build up civil services. How are we delivering civil services to our, our people, right? Medical, um, in this particular case. So medical records. Another is, is on the, the, the crime side. If people know who you are, from a medical perspective and can and know your procedures and know what you've done and undergone over time, where you've lived, all your personal information, that's a record we can use to go attempt to extract money from you. We can, we can fashion a really, really excellent spear phishing campaign if we know everything that's happened to you from a medical perspective over, over time. So you can use the data type analysis combined with your media presence, your external media presence. Are we a company that often comes under media fire? That's where you might draw the ire of, act, of activists or hacktivists, right? You don't want to see an anonymous operation that's op, you know, city or county of, of whatever because you guys have been in the news. But you can prepare for these things and you can establish your, your response plan uh, and your communication plan directed at these likely threats. So, you know, if you guys haven't done that, it's a nice, it's a fun thought exercise. What data types do I have in my environment? What threat actors are likely going to come after those data types? How are they going to come after those data types, right? And we start backing into making uh, risk-based decisions about our IT infrastructure. We also start backing into what are these likely scenarios going to look like from a comms plan, and how do we stay ahead of this when something happens? Thank you. I have five minutes left, so I'll accelerate a little bit here. Next piece is early detection of compromise, right? This is the perimeter breach. When perimeter defenses fail and our defense in depth fails, what do we do next? Who's looking at client-to-client -client communications? Probably nobody, right? How often does a client machine, a client workstation environment collect to, connect to another client workstation in the environment? I would rel I'd argue that's relatively infrequent. You can instrument for that. And the detection of that's pretty simple, right? You have CIDR ranges for all those endpoints. They're outside of your server farms. Clients should be connecting to servers. Clients should be connecting to the perimeter. Clients should not be connecting to clients, right? That's that lateral movement. That's a uh, infiltrate post infiltration tactic that's going to be leveraged. That's how ransomware spreads. That's how you know threat actors move laterally in organization. It's something to consider. The other piece is new client client excuse me new client connections to servers. So a client that's never connected to a particular server internally. That's something you can monitor for. And there's some interesting TechNet articles on how to gather that data and start doing that collection. And of course, we're all very kind of overwhelmed, I suppose, with the SMB stuff, right? Eternal blue vulnerabilities exposed by the NSA leaks uh, caused WannaCry to be particularly uh, um, effective. Uh, so SMB traffic and share mounting also becomes interesting in that context. So what happens when they put the uniforms on? They gained a foothold. They're moving east and west. Now they have administrative or domain credentials. They're North Korean uh, servicemen or soldiers in South Korean uniforms. Now we have to start seeing what we're doing with privileged accounts, right? Do we stand up honey accounts? We stand up a honey account. We log in with those credentials at machines that have a tendency to stay on for a long time, public facing uh, machines, maybe web servers. Turn that account on. We log in. Those creden credentials are cached. Then we disable that account or we change the credentials on the account and we log very carefully attempts to log in with that particular account. That tells us that those that an, inf an infiltration point has been attempted, 
privilege es escalation has occurred, and now the collection of administrative pr privileges is being attempted, right? Honey, honey accounts. Some of this can be commercialized. There's some interesting approaches to it, but you can do this yourself. Uh, you know, and again, you probably want to have a long-running server because those credentials are cached, and then those caches are cleared upon restart. Reduce your service accounts, right? I mean, we've been talking about that since the 90s. We still haven't done it effectively even as industry, I don't think, but we're getting there. And then test your user machines. Test your web-facing machines. Go pull down Mimikatz and run it and see exactly what happens. What kind of credentials can you pull back? Mimikatz is open source. Um, it's simple to obtain. It's available through Metals Metasploit as well if you don't want to go compile it yourself. Um, but go grab it, pull it down, and see what exists because you will be surprised with the credentials you can pull out of memory on a standard machine. This tells you the next step in the movement of, of the attacker, right? You know where they're going to go next. Last, last, phase, or last piece is, is data exfil, right? You can see the trains here. This is a, like a World War II version of the literal supply trains. These have changed now. They're all wheeled or whatever. Um, you'll notice a general absence of the same security we expect closer to the front, right? You don't see foxholes and all that stuff. Here, what you see is you know, a soft underbelly. Um, similar things exist in our environments. We put our reliance on perimeter prevention, and everything else is probably going to be OK in a lot of cases. So again, are we looking at client connections to server grade tech? Are we logging those? Are we making and noting anomalies? Some clients are expected to connect to these servers. Most are not. Um, are we alerting on privileged access to those servers, whether it's DBA access or whether it's DB access, whether it's underlying OS uh, access? Are we uh, logging and taking a look at who is accessing these resources at a privilege, with privileged access? And then finally, and probably the most difficult, is managing and maintaining some sort of operational oversight of the outbound transfers from those servers. Now, your database server is not going to connect directly to command and control for exfiltration, right? There's prepackaging. So a client, an infected workstation with access to that server, is going to collect that data, package it up, and then establish an outbound tunnel uh, in the most surreptitious way pos possible to leak that data. And those become, you know, it, that's a, it's variable based upon the attack group. Some are very quick. You'll see a spike in output. Some are low and slow, leaking over time. But looking at those, those transfers from a server to a client is something that I think is very, very attainable in, a, in an IT environment. So we have one minute, almost on time, minus a lot of questions, which uh, we'll see. Um, Korea is super unique. Uh, it's a very interesting case study. I think there's a lot of kind of vignette style IT security applicability if you take a look. If nothing else, I think in the future, again, it's going to become something that is, you know, something of legends, right? This doesn't happen elsewhere. This is almost like a, an Egyptian style, you know, ancient Egyptian style of governance where you promoted an individual to the pharaoh who is, you know, the son of Ra, right? The deification of these leaders. Uh, it's super interesting. So at the very least, if you get nothing out of this briefing, um, just get a little more educated on Korea because it's, it's, I think it's a cool conversation point. There's a reason we call our uh, web server farms DMZ. Many people don't know that, right? The demilitarized zone is specific to Korea. Again, it's the most militarized place in the world. Um, and I think that's pretty cool, at the very least. Uh, and finally, you know, really what I want you to get out of this is assume prevention will fail. And what are you doing to stay ahead of that, right? Perimeter detection, uh, prevention will fail. Interior prevention will fail. Are we, are we doing the risk analysis to start figuring out what we do in the case of that inevitable failure? When we see the most spectacular breaches, breaches on television or in the news, they may not, may not have done a great job of doing that analysis. Um, so, and then finally, rehearse. Rehearse, 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 rehearse. You're never going to do anything well when you're being shot at. You haven't rehearsed. Um, so practice that. And then the picture is pretty funny. That's a USB charger in southern Korea. Uh, they actually have banks of these along the wall. So you see like all these people plugging their devices into uh, that's Kim Jong-il's head there. Um, or no, that's Kim Jong-un, his son, the current leader, great leader. But uh, with that, we're slightly over. Does anybody behind, uh, besides Kim Jong-il have any questions? Nothing. Shut up, Justin. Roger. So, Sir. So like, um, yeah, it's uh, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Like sometimes it's just the time you have to put in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes think about like create a template, but then there's ever changing um, different type of attack. Mm -hmm. If your template will be out of date, what would you suggest that 
you know, you have to balance the time, the, you know, the resource you have, which most of the time is manpower. So how do you adjust for finding the time to come up with a plan first and then repeat it and then adjust the plan for the Yep, that's a great question. So, you know, in the military, we had a, you know, a saying that the more you sweat in garrison, the less you bleed in combat, right? Um, it's worth the time. I think that you can focus efforts when it comes to rehearsal by doing some of the risk analysis about the data types that your environment has, as well as the public exposure that your environment has. That gets you at least looking at the right groups. And this is an iterative process, right? You do this one time, you're not going to be right. You're going to find failures in the organization that are going to lend themselves to some corrective efforts, but this needs to be an iterative process, I would, I would, I would argue. Um, over time, as you become better at it, the time reduces. And the time reduces for the re rehearsals, your capability is to perform that action increase. So I would, I would argue that it's worth it um, to do the rehearsals, because otherwise you're going to be stabbing in the dark when you're under fire. Right? You're going to be the guy that's like, oh, man. I was supposed to have that battery ready when I started hearing the sirens for incoming shells because I'm going to blow that rock drop, but I don't have the battery, you know, as of the tea shop or whatever, right? That's where we end up getting with, caught with our pants down because we're not really doing the external risk assessment. We're not rehearsing our actions on contact, and now we're, again, we're just reacting to the enemy. They continue to have the lead in the, the decision cycle. So not, I mean, that's where we're all at, right? We don't dedicate the time to that as an industry, and I think that that's a challenge. That's my proposition to you is maybe at least consider maybe even a little bit of time, you know, quarterly, think about it. Any other questions? Okay, I am three minutes over. I apologize. Thanks for your time today. Uh, I'll be here for a few more minutes if you guys need anything, and otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.